Kind of funny. Chris, you're not on my. Uh... Could you send me by email? So it's not going because of that reason. Okay. Try that link. Mm -hmm. I haven't got it yet. Hi, is anybody uh, on the uh, live session? If you're there, can you um, put your name or say something in the chat section so that I can know that you have joined and uh, you can hear us? Hi, uh, are you, are you, if you're there, uh, can you respond back so that we know that you have joined? So we will start exactly uh, in uh, after two minutes. So now it's uh, 9, 3 a.m. here. So we'll just give a little bit more time for other people to join in. And then we will start. Uh, you can just type it out, type this link. Can you type this link? No, it's not a full thing. No, no, give it to me. Okay, so can you check? Okay, okay, great. Uh, we are able to see your comments. Sorry, this is our very first session, so there may be a little bit of problem from our side. Uh, we are still learning. Uh, this is our first YouTube live session, so just bear with us. And uh, hopefully we, we will continue. So. Um, okay, so it's 9.05 and uh, I think uh, we, we have a lot of things to cover today. So we are going to uh, start. Uh, we have, I think, 12 viewers that I can see. Um, so I'm going to uh, get started. Let's see how is it showing on screen. Yeah. Are you able to see my screen? No? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so it seems there is a little bit of a lag, uh, but let me know. We are also looking at your um, uh, your comments. So if you are facing any uh, issues, just comment over there and we can uh, look at it. 
Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for uh, showing interest um, in these sessions and uh, for connecting with me and uh, uh, you know uh, joining us today here. So it's morning over here. We are in Tempe, Arizona, mm -hmm. and it's just morning, just past nine o'clock. I know uh, some of you have joined from India. If you want to go ahead and uh, type out your name and where you are located, then we can know who all have joined and where you are uh, located right now and it may help us uh, later on when we plan uh, for the session so if you're able to hear uh, hear me and you are able to see the screen can you just confirm that by uh, you know typing out uh, your name and your location so that uh, we know that we are reaching you guys hi andrew I can see Rakesh, I can see uh, Ahmed, can you scroll up? You can see Sagar. Okay, so I think everyone can hear and I think people are able to see the screen as well. So uh, we will get started. Um, okay, some people are texting me on LinkedIn that they cannot see the previous one. Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, so guys, if uh, all of you who have joined here, can some of you respond uh, to on the uh, on that uh, group chat that we have on LinkedIn, and maybe give them uh, the name of the channel or the link so that they can join in. So, it looks like some people are uh, having trouble in uh, finding the link or something. They are texting me over here, but I cannot just answer them because I am. Here on live, so if you can help them out, that will be great. Okay, but I think we we will get started. We are way past uh, nine, so we won't delay anymore. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Sonila. I am the person that you are connected with on LinkedIn, <laughs> and uh, with me uh, in the room today, I uh, uh, also have uh, Nan. Uh, so uh, I work as a knowledge and insight specialist at, at Arizona State University. And uh, before that, I did my master's also at ASU. Uh, and with me, I have Nan Cheng, and she yeah, is- uh, I'm currently a student at ASU pursuing uh, my master degree program, majoring in business analytics. And uh, she's from China. She's a student, and yeah. uh, she uh, is here in uh, here in the room with me. And she will be helping me uh, to go through the slides. And she'll also uh, be looking at your comments. And if you have any uh, questions, she will be uh, helping me with that. Um, just uh, wanted to show you some pictures that I took this morning on my way uh, over here. It, it is it's a raining morning here <laughs> at at Tempe. Uh, so uh, this is a picture when I was just getting out of my home this morning and uh, and this is a picture of uh, the wp carey school of business so we are right now in one of the uh, graduate conferences conference rooms at uh, the uh, at the college and that's where we are coming live on uh, we probably when we get a bit more comfortable doing these things we will show you around the campus a bit uh, on our live <laughs> cameras but we, we are just right now just struggling first of all just to do this session so we don't want to complicate it further by doing way too many things but uh, but we definitely want to do that um so uh, this is the book that i have used for some of the slides that i will be presenting today uh, this book is called uh, business analytics data analysis and decision making uh, it's by uh, albright and winston it's a pretty good book uh, i have read this book uh, and it covers it doesn't have any machine learning stuff in it like it has only statistics uh, stuff but it covers almost all of the basics and all of the uh, things that you need to just get yourself started. So, and it has a lot of examples, a lot of problems to practice, and it also teaches you how to uh, use Excel in like a very advanced level. So, it's a very good book. If you are planning to, uh, you know, invest in any book, uh, you can definitely uh, take a look on this one. I I do keep a copy of this with myself to use as as reference. So that's that's, that's the book that I was comfortable with. So I thought I will use this book for for part of uh, this presentation and. Uh, um, and we will be uh, using it in future uh, sessions as well. And as and when I use other books, um, uh, I will be updating you like which book I am following so that if you want to offline study that book or go through examples and practice that, you know, you can. 
you can do that on your own. Uh, so just wanted to tell you what uh, book we are referencing here. Uh, okay, so I see a few people. Uh, hi, Rohit. Uh, hi, Sagar, Priyanshu. Thanks for joining. Um, so if you have just joined, uh, my I'm Sonila. Uh, I'm uh, your connection on LinkedIn. <laughs> and with me, I have Nan yeah, Chen, who is, who is a student uh, at ASU. And we both are uh, in a room over here. In, uh, in the WP Carey School of Business. Okay, so a little bit of introduction, uh, and then uh, we'll go through some of the concepts that I had planned for today, and then we'll end with some information about the next session. Uh, so uh, I work at ASU, and a uh, lot of you connected with me. A lot of you had so many questions about how to get started on uh, data analytics, data science. You know, many of you are students who are not. Uh, sure how to get started in this field and there are a lot of information going around and uh, there are a lot of these uh, uh, education companies nowadays who come up with so many packages for with, with, which are really expensive and uh, and i thought that you know for a student or somebody it's really i mean i i won't spend that much money myself so you know these sessions are totally free and I work full time, so I cannot really go uh, into a lot of detail, but I, I will try my best that I am able to give you at least enough information and enough knowledge of the concept so that you can then go on your own and you can then start off um, doing your own uh, you know, uh, studies and uh, move forward and study advanced concepts. So that's that's my goal here. And that's why I started this these sessions. And if some 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 of you after going through these sessions, you feel that data science is not for you, you know, you don't like you hate statistics, and then that's fine, you know, you, you without spending any money, you can decide if this career is for you or not. So that's, that's kind of the goal here. And um, uh, if you and we will be going through uh, slides uh, by slides, and I will be explaining different things. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, if you feel I'm going too fast, or I'm not loud enough, or I'm just you know talking about things you don't want to listen <laughs> or something, just type it out in the comment and let me know. As I said, I'm doing this for the first time. I've done many presentations in my life, but I've not done any. YouTube live or anything like this. So let me know, and I will be, uh, you know, I will improve, and I will make sure that you know, I'm, I'm because I'm doing this for you, and if, if it's not helping you, it makes no sense. So let me know if I'm not really uh, coming, uh, not really sharing the things that you want to hear about, and I will try to improve, and I'll try to do things the way that you know that you uh, enjoy. So. Uh, so that's a little bit of introduction here. And then uh, uh, I have laid down the agenda. We will talk about some of the very uh, basic uh, statistical, even before we go into statistics, these are the very basic things that we should know. Uh, I also wanted to cover descriptive statistics. But when we were going through the slides yesterday, I just felt that it is way too much information for us. It will take a lot of time. And I also do not want to do that in a hurry and then just give you little information. So we will do that as a separate session. Like the next session, we will go over all the descriptive statistics stuff in detail. So now we will just kind of set the stage here and get ourselves a little bit um, into uh, uh, you know the world of statistics. So, and then at the end, you know, we'll go through uh, what we want to uh, talk about in the next session. So I'm not going to talk about what is the definition of data science or the definition of statistics. I hope all of you know that. And if you don't, you can just Google it. You know, it'll probably get a better definition than what I can give you. So I'm not going to talk about what is data science. I'm thinking you guys already know that. So that's why you are here today. So I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm I'm going to directly jump in and I'm going to directly start with uh, some of the basic concepts here. Um, so the first session today, we will be focusing on exploring data. Uh, as a data scientist or a data analyst, if you if if you are already one or you are aspiring to be one, I mean, the most amount of time that you will spend, you will spend on exploring data and understanding data. And uh, I do that. And even Nan, she even if she's a student, she works on so many projects, and she also spends a lot of her time in just understanding your data. You know, you have to become the master of your data. You um, may not become uh, the master of coding, but you have to be the master of your data. You need to know it in and out if, because that's where you start from. You start from learning your data, and if your data is not right and you have not understood it it doesn't matter what kind of analysis you are doing on it what advanced machine learning you are doing on it everything will be wrong 
So the very first step is becoming so familiar with your data that you know everything about it, right? So that's that's where we are going to start with it. We're not going to start with some coding, how to code in Python, how to do machine learning algorithm. We're not going to start with that. That's come, that comes much later. You first have to know your data. You should know how to play around with your data. You, you have to know how to transform your data. So you first have to know about that. So that's why this first session and maybe few other sessions after this, we will only be talking about understanding data and how to explore it in different ways. So that's what we will do uh, in this session. OK, so the very first concept that I'm going to talk about today is that of a population and a sample. And this is, uh, and I'm following for these few slides, I'm following uh, the way uh, things are laid out in the book. And I'm taking the definitions from the book. Uh, so, uh, so what is a population and what is a sample? And this is something that I frequently deal with. I frequently have to decide, OK, what is my population? I'm, I have this problem that I want to solve. So what is my population and what is my sample? So I'm going to talk about that by giving an example because otherwise it just may not make much sense. So, uh, so here we have uh, the definition. So a population includes all of the entities of interest, people, household, machines. Uh, this is the definition that is there in the book. And the sample is a subset of the population which is randomly chosen and preferably representative of the population. So what does that mean? How does that mean in the re in the real world if somebody comes and talks to you? Oh, this is the population. This is the sample. What what does that mean? So so let's say let's say that I am the VP of business or something in a particular company, and I uh, have this website, and I want to know whether all my website users are happy with this website. You know, I have this big website and I'm selling products on it. And I have to make this presentation to my uh, my CEO and I need to update my CEO that how is this website doing and do we want to uh, do we want to change uh, anything on our website or we want to, uh, you know, modify some features or add something, you know, I want to take some business decisions here and I want to update my leadership on that. So I want to know how is my website doing? So that's my business problem. And I have my data scientist. I have Nan. Suppose Nan is my data scientist in my team. So I go to her. Now, I personally don't know any statistics or anything. So I go to, I'm just a business person. So I just, I go to Nan and I ask Nan, like, hey, Nan, I want to know how is our website doing? Can you help me with it? Can you find out is our website being liked by the customer? And I just want to know uh, what happened in the last one year in the, all the people that are, have been using our website. I just want to know how, how much they're liking our website. And um, can you find that out for me? But hey, but you don't have like five months to do it. You know, you just have two weeks. At the end of two weeks, I need to present it to my uh, CEO. So can you do that for me? So I go to her and I give her this business problem. And th these are the problems that you will get. Like these are the problems I get. Maybe not this simple, but something like that. You know, I get these kind of problems from my uh, leadership who come to me and then they just randomly throw questions at me. Hey, can you find this number for me? You know, and I then go about calculating that number. So this is a very real life uh, problem, but you know, kind of simplified, but kind of problem that you might face. So so let's say I have this problem and I go to my data analyst or my data scientist and ask them to solve this problem for me. And then the first step then will be for Nan to think about, OK, what's my data here? Who am I going to, what data am I going to collect? And how am I going to calculate all of this here? So at that point, probably her very first question would be, what's my population? Her first question won't be whether I will use Python for this, <laughs> whether I will use random forest for this, or, you know, that all that won't be her question. Her question would be like, what's my data? You know, she will start by collecting her data, first of all, you know, and you won't be uh, like the way we are given all these uh, very nice and clean data uh, during our, uh, you know, classes and all it won't be like that she has first because she first has to think okay what is my data here and no one is going to give her that data she has to think about it so that's when she has to think what is my population here and what is my sample here so her population in this case will be all the people who have ever used that website in the last one year because that's what her business vp wants to know they want to know about last one year. They don't want to know about the entire history of times. So they will only focus with 
the last one year. So that is a population, you know. And if it was a different business problem with the same website, it could have been a different population. If you wanted to know for 10 years, then her population would have increased and it would have been 10 years worth of data. But now, because he has already specified a time limit, she'll only look at 10 years. So that's the population, all the people who came to that website in the last one year. So that's her entire population. It will change. It will change business problem to business problem. It's not going to be fixed. It's not like the population of this country. It is fixed. Not always fixed, but it's fixed <laughs> for this point of time. So, um, you know, it's not like that. So it, it will keep on changing. So now when she has decided her population, then her next step will be, OK, I have two weeks of time. Can I go and ask each of these people? Let's say she calculated and she found that, you know, there are a, a million people had come to this website in the last one year, like million unique users. Now, there's no way that she can go and ask each of them and then ask and take an average and then calculate some number and give it to them. It's not possible. If it was possible, it's great. She'll do that. You know, if it was just 50 people, she'll just go and ask each one of them. There are a million people. So that's where the concept of sample comes in. Now, she has to pick only a, a little sample out of that data that she can work with, that is feasible for her, that she can collect within the time frame and the resources that she has available you know sometimes it can be also funding issue you may not have that much money to go and ask so many people or you cannot email so many people you may have other kind of constraints that you cannot just ask all the people so you only can ask few people so she will then collect her sample she'll probably say okay i have a million people but maybe you know just by asking 100 people i can get a pretty good idea of how people are liking our website. So she'll just go and she'll just ask 100 people. So those 100 people are her sample. And while she is uh, getting this sample, she also has to keep in mind that her sample should be representative of her population. So if in my population, if last one year, all the people who visited my website in them 50% were male and 50% are female. Now in her samples, she has to make sure that that ratio is maintained. She cannot just take the you know 90% male and 10% female, and that will make all her calculations wrong. Or anything, you know, if the, the way the ethnicity is distributed or the age groups are distributed within her population, she has to make sure that the same kind of representation is happening in her sample. And that's why I say it is very important. You know, it's not something that you can just do it. You have to think about it. You have to think, OK, you have to spend some time with your data and you have to really get yourself familiarized with it and see, OK, how is my population? Who are my customers? How do they look like? You have to really spend time on that and think about it and from that. And we will talk about what are the different sampling techniques. We will talk about how to decide your sample size, whether you want to pick 100 people or 500 people or just 10 people. How do you decide that number? So we'll talk about that. But I want to give you an idea by giving an example, like what is this population and what is the sample and why is it important? So now when she has got her sample, all her statistical analysis or whatever she wants to do, maybe she wants to build a model or whatever, everything now will be done on that sample. She'll do everything on that sample. And this sample can be anything. Now, I'm telling 100. It could be 1,000. It could be 10,000. It could be anything based on her uh, you know, business problem. So let's say she just took 100 people, and then she sent out surveys to, you know, let's say she sent out 100 uh, surveys to 500 people. but 100 people responded and she was happy because she wanted 100 responses from 100 people so she got that so now she will do all her calculations whatever it is she wants to calculate whatever formula she wants to apply she will do all that and then let's say she comes up with a number and she finds okay it seems like 80 percent of people uh, in my sample are really happy and uh, so now she is ready and she wants to go and tell her vp that i have calculated it's uh, two weeks are over and I've done all my statistical analysis and I'm now ready to give you my number and she tells him but when she tells him the number she won't tell that okay this is what is happening in the sample no what she will tell is what is going on in the population because that's where the VP wants to know the VP doesn't want to know what's the opinion of 100 people we are using 100 people to know the opinion of a million people we are not interested in just those 100 people. They are just helping us to figure out 
how those million people are thinking about that website. So when she tells her um, her VP, because she has not really asked the million people, there is always a chance of error. So whenever she communicates to him, she will tell, OK, I think 80% of people are right. But I also think that there is a chance of error. You know, there's an error uh, of 10% in my calculation. So she will tell it like that. So that's so just so that she is covering up for all the other people that she did not ask for opinion. So based on that, she will tell that to business VP. And now I, I the business VP, I know. OK, fine. So 80 percent of people seem to be happy, but there is a chance that, you know, there's some chance of error and that's fine. And then I can then take whatever business decision I want to make based on that data. So that's how she will solve. You know, so that's how uh, she will think about the population, the sample, the way she will calculate us, uh, pick a sample and then do an analysis and then finally she will give her result and when she's giving her result you know this is a very simple scenario but it could be a deck of 100 slides and she'll go through each of them and she will explain 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 but uh, but everything she will be talking about will be about the population nothing will be about the sample even though that's all she worked with okay so that's kind of uh, what is a population and what is a sample and why why they are important. I, I hope uh, you guys are understanding and following. Uh, but if you are not following because of any reason, if I'm going too fast, uh, just uh, go ahead and type it out and uh, uh, we'll see. OK, so now uh, here are some questions that I kind of thought about and I put here again to explain this concept to you more. And uh, Nan is going to help me out here. and. Uh, so uh, these are just some random business questions mm -hmm. or problems that someone might get and they want to solve. So uh, so Nan is kind of going to be your representative here, and she's going to try and answer these questions. But you guys can also type the answer or think about the uh, what could be the answer to these uh, questions. Uh, so the first question is, how would you define the population if I want to analyze the sentiment of users towards Donald Trump on Facebook. So let's say because of whatever reasons, I want to understand the sentiment of users. You know, maybe I want to know how Donald Trump is going to do in the next election or whatever it is. I want to do some prediction or whatever. So I want to understand sentiment. So I have this problem. So then, Nan, how do you think that you should define the population for uh, for this particular problem that we have here. Mm -hmm. So I think first of all, I may think who is the uh, Facebook user. They either can be individual who use Facebook to um, recall their daily life, and they also can be companies who run their account for their business. So um, here, if I want to analyze the sentiment of users toward Don Donald Trump on Facebook, I think I will only consider those people who used to comment on Donald Trump's comment uh, post or how some um uh, how post something about Donald Trump exactly. as the population. Yeah, exactly. and I think we also have an answer on the comment section that the entire comments by Facebook users discussing about trump yeah so any comment or because we want to focus only on donald trump so we don't want to know about every other post that everyone else has posted right so we want to only focus on trump so we we will look at only those posts which probably have the word donald trump or just trump or the president of united states you know something that tells us okay that this is about uh, mr trump and we will look at all the posts all the comments and, we, and that will be our data set you know so those will those comments made by all these users, and we can have a time limit also. It could be for the last one year or five years, based on you know, based on our problem, we will decide what's our population. So, yeah. same way, like how would you define a population if I want to analyze the ratings for horror movies on Netflix? Mm, in this case, I think uh, all the people who is interested in horror movie can be part of my population. How do you think, guys? Uh, and what do you think if I if I want to analyze? Okay, how is uh, you know? Let's say I am part of the ASU Police Department, mm -hmm. and you are a data analyst with within the Police Department of ASU, and you want to know um, uh, 
how how is female safety on your campus let's say you are taking a lot of measures mm -hmm. uh, you know you have uh, night patrol happening you know you have set up all these new lights on the campus and now you want to know how is female safety on campus is safety good or still females are facing problems so you i i am from the police department you are the data analyst and i come and assign you this problem so how will you define the population for this uh, problem that you have uh, i may consider all the females in asu as my po population they can they can be a female student they can be a female faculty a faculty member they also can be uh, some employee employee here exactly so uh, when we talk about uh, female females on asu campus they're not necessarily only students right they could be anybody that comes to the campus you know female faculty members uh, just female employees you know so anybody that is a female we're not focused about males here so we will only take them as our uh, our data and then we will work with it and uh, uh, can you identify some sample data sets now these are your population you decided so can you pick any one of these and tell me um, what would be probably how would you go about creating a sample data from here yeah yeah sure uh, i think for the uh, for, for the last uh, question if i want to take a sample data set i want to make sure like the data set is taken uh, randomly and can represent the entire is you female population so we have a comment here by sagar that by looking at past crime records oh yeah yeah you you can so we can have you know we can look at so many things we can yeah. look at mm -hmm. when we are trying to look at our uh, female safety we can look at past crime we uh, you know and then we can do our current calculation and we can compare them both you know i can look at what happened last year in the asu campus were there any crimes against females and we can see okay what happened this year after i made all these upgrades you know i have 10 uh, policemen walking around the campus at night what's going on now you know so uh, have the crime rates gone down or they're gone up you know so we we mm -hmm. can uh, take last year's crime records and we can come up with more uh, you know insights for uh, uh, for whomsoever has asked that question so so uh, you know so think think about different kind of such uh, problems that you have uh, or you face or you know think about what is your population because this is where you will start from and you uh, you sh you as a data scientist should know who is your population you should understand it enough to be able to gather data from different sources and if you cannot even do this then everything else after this is not going to make sense you know you can come up with completely wrong numbers in fact that's always one of my big fears that <laughs> everything that i calculated is completely wrong uh, you know so uh, so you have to make sure that uh, you are starting off on the right foot that you are you know really really making that effort to find out who is your population and who is your sample so i hope this gives you um, understanding because uh, later on we are going to look at some uh, some formula and some other things uh, which are uh, where you need to be able to make this distinction what am i talking about am i talking about sample am i talking about population or what is the relationship between them so that's why i'm going through this in a bit detail Okay, so now when that is clear, these are some very, I think most of you already would know about this, but then uh, it's important that we also go through uh, them. Um, so here uh, on the next slide, I don't know if it's okay, it's, it's there. So uh, we have data sets and variables and observations. You know, if you have already worked with you know data, and you have, or even if like uh, on a database, like a relational database or anything, you already know, you know, uh, generally the data that you will have that you'll work with, it will be arranged in like rows and columns, and every row is like an observation, and uh, every column is kind of a characteristic or a trait of the data. You know, so as a data scientist or data analyst you will be constantly you know working with different data sets you know they may not always be very nice and very clean they may not be in an excel sheet everything looking very nice they could be in so many different forms but probably when you you, you will clean it up and you will create it in a way that you can work with so you, 
anytime you get a lot of data, it could be in Excel, it could be in a database, it could be an SPSS file, it could just be a text file, you know, whatever it is, you know, that's your data set. And then any variable in that, uh, you know, let's say you are collecting data about employees of, a, of an organization. So uh, anything that defines those, uh, the uh, defines those employees, you know, their age, their height, their location, their gender, each of them are kind of the attributes or the features of those um, employees that on which on whom you have collected the data and an observation is a single row of data, you know, like a single uh, if for one employee, everything that defines that employee so one entire row that represents that employee so that's an observation this, these are pretty straightforward thing uh so here again just to clarify just to understand it further so here we have um on next slide i don't know it is if it's already showing on your computers okay so um so here i have a data set and i'm going to ask nan here that if she gets this data set randomly, somebody comes and gives you this mm -hmm. data data set here. What do you think? What do you see about the data here? Right? Um, I can see the information about three people here, and I think the variables uh, age, gender, state, children, salary, and opinion, and the average uh, observations are in each row. Like for instance, for the first people. Uh, um, his age is 35, a uh, male who lives in Minnesota and how has one child, um, salary is um, 65,000 and how opinion as five. Right. So when, uh, when you, uh, you know, collect your data, um, first row black are variables and second, yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. So when you get your data, don't immediately jump into solutions, conclusions. You know, don't start thinking what algorithm you'll use. Don't don't even go there. If you go there, you are changing your focus to the solution. You first have to understand what is the problem. And, and you should probably spend most of your time understanding the problem and understanding the data. So when you get a data set like this, a very simplified data set, but even then it tells us so many things. You know, you should first understand okay what's the, what's the size of my data set like how many observations are there because even that will help you in deciding what kind of analysis you will do on that right so this is a pretty small data set there are only three observations here and there are three people so as soon as you look at this you know okay this is data about people you know because data could be about anything it could be about buildings you know it could be about animals so you see here that this is data about people and then you see that okay you have information about the gender. So you have one, two, three, four, five, you have six um, pieces of information for each uh, each person here, you know, and you, uh, you get a little bit of idea about, so first spend some time to understand how big your data is, how many rows are there, how many columns are there, what does that data represent on a high level? So that's how you, you get started. So that should be your first step. Once you have understood what's your sample, whatever, and you have get some data, you now are trying to, uh, you know, step by step understanding it more and more. Uh, so that brings us to what are the different types of data. So this is very important because if, based on what is the type of data, you will think of different ways to work with that data the way you will deal with numbers may not be same the way you will deal with some kind of a categorical data you know like days of the week so it it, it would be different based on what kind of data you are dealing with so i'll go through all the different types of data that we generally uh, will encounter uh, when, while solving a problem and then we'll look at some examples uh, so the first type is numerical so I think all of us know, even if we are not data scientists, we know what is numerical data. You know, we are constantly shopping or <laughs> doing online transactions. We are constantly, uh, you know, surrounded by numbers. So, uh, you know, so numerical, I mean, if we go the book definition, so it's, uh, you know, any any variable on which you can do some mean, meaningful arithmetic operations. So those are numerical 
uh, data. And the ones on which you cannot do any uh, arithmetic operation, so those are called as categorical data, right? So for example, like numbers, uh, you know, if I'm talking about some age and all, so those are numerical data or, you know, some I'm talking about some dollars and all some money. So that's like numerical data, but categorical data is like uh, something like gender, like male and female, right? Or something like January, February, March, April, those are all categorical data, right? So, and categorical data again can be ordinal or it can be nominal. So ordinal is data which inherently has an order to it. I don't need to explicitly mention that this is the order of the data. And the very good example of that is the months in the year or the days of a week. As soon as I tell you Wednesday, you immediately know, OK, Tuesday comes before Wednesday and Thursday comes after Wednesday. I don't have to tell you that. You already know that order, right? So that's that's data which already has an order to it. You know, and things like um, uh, you know, uh, small, medium, large. If I tell you small, medium, large, you already know what's the relationship between them. You know, like if I tell tall and short, you already know what's the relationship between tall and short. So these are not numerical data. These are categorical data, but they have an order to it. And nominal is the data which does not have any order to it, like male and female. Between male and male and female are categorical data, but they don't have any order. If I tell you male and female, you won't know which comes first, which comes second, you know, unless I provide you some more information with it explicitly. So that's the kind of data which has no order to it, right? So again, you when you are analyzing your data, you definitely have to pay attention. Is this ordinal data? You know, uh, is this numerical data? You have to pay attention to that. And then uh, we have uh, something called ratio and interval. So this, these two types, we will again talk about them in the next session because I think it needs a little bit uh, more time. Um, Oh yeah, I think we can we can see all messages, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, are there any messages that we have, we have missed? No. Okay. okay. Yeah. No, we are seeing all messages. Okay. So, um, so yeah. So for ratio and interval, I'll again talk about uh, in the next session. But just know that ratio data is data where there is some ratio to it. You know, I mean, if you uh, are looking at let's say height or length let's let's talk about length so if i give you two lengths you you should be able to say okay this length is twice the other length right so you will be able to kind of calculate uh, ratio so uh, for example if, if i have like a graph and on the x axis i'm plotting you know uh, 0 10 20 30 uh, so you know, each of them uh, not 0 10 30 like it's like 10, let's say 20, 40, 80. So I have all these intervals and all of them have a ratio between them, like an equal ratio between them. So, um, uh, and that that kind of data, if you have a column in your data set, which has data, which has data like 20, 40, 80, you know, every time it is um, becoming double. So that's kind of uh, a ratio data where you have a ratio. And then interval, again, very similar to ratio. It's kind of, uh, you know, each where each number is um, placed at the equal interval of the other uh, other set of data that you have. So this needs more example. So we will again touch upon this uh, in the next class uh, and also try to understand a bit more detail about ratio and interval. But for today, I want you to at least understand what is numerical, categorical, ordinal, nominal we have more <laughs> we have we have uh, something that's called uh, a dummy dummy data and then we have something called bind uh, data so what what is dummy data so uh, so so whenever you are getting um, a data set so the way you get it may not exactly be the way that you actually end up using it so for example i get this data set i may not use it as is as is into my analysis, I may change it. And, you, and how you change it is up to you. There's so many ways that you can change it. So, uh, and we'll also see in one of these slides how this data was uh, was changed. But the dummy, um, dummy variables are variables that you create, you transform your data, you have some column, and but because of whatever reason, you don't want to use that data that way, and you want to create your own variables. And I'll give an example. So let's say we have a column, which is days of week. 
and in every column you ha and in every row the days of the week is filled like let's say in one of the uh, one of the rows it says sunday in one of the rows it says monday wednesday so you have a column which only contains all the days of the week sunday monday tuesday like that and now you got this data and you want to do some analysis on it but then because of whatever reason you uh, you know which we will again talk about later but you decide that okay i don't want my data to be this way i want it in a different way so what you do you go ahead and you create seven different columns and you name them as per the days of the week so instead of having one column which carries all this uh, data you will have seven columns and you will name them monday tuesday wednesday thursday like that and then if the first record had the value monday in it then you will populate one in that column but if it had tuesday on it instead you will have the monday column carrying zero and you will have one in the tuesday column and so on so if somebody has no uh, days of the week data present then all of them will carry 0000, 0, 0, 0, 0. but if mm, somebody has wednesday then the wednesday column will have one on it and the rest of the columns will have zero on it because every every person just had one days of week so that's how you create dummy dummy variables so that the way you code your variables to have zero and one instead of you know having the original value on it so there are actually packages on and all available in i think r python where mm -hmm. uh, you can just run that on your data and it will generate the dummy variables for you or you can do it manually if you want to do it but that's another thing that you will be another kind of uh, data and uh, that's 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 called like data transformation when you are transforming your data from the way you got it to something else and then we have binned or discretized like bins like i think everybody know about like bins you know we create if you had like uh, something like age data like you have uh, like the way we have here we have age uh, 35 61 37 we have this age data so instead of that i can maybe replace it replace my data by saying okay age 0 to 10 this age 11 to 20 this and so i am kind of creating bins i'm creating these ranges instead of having individual row for individual person i'm kind of summarizing them and i'm taking only ranges so that's that's how again that's that may sometimes be given to you that that's that's how or you may even do some data transformation and you create your the bins yourself right so that's another type of uh, data that you will uh, work with very frequently. And that brings, uh, brings us to something that is called discrete data and continuous data. Again, this is something that is very important and uh, probably after numerical and categorical, this is important, discrete and continuous data. So discrete data is data that you can count, that you can count on your fingers, you know, whereas continuous is generally the result of some kind of a measurement so let's say for example if i ask someone how many people are there in a room so they can count and they can tell me okay there are 10 people but if i ask somebody to measure somebody's height then they will measure and then they will tell me okay it was 5.2346 something like that so uh, i personally uh, you know uh, when i'm looking at some data i will see okay how many digits are there after the decimal point and that's how i decide okay this is a continuous variable uh, and care uh, whether it's a discrete discrete variable i mean just by looking at it if it's a whole number i will say okay this probably is a discrete variable or if it has so many digits after uh, the decimal point then maybe this is a continuous variable but again it's up to you you can actually change you can change a discrete into uh, may not be changing discrete into continuous but you can change <laughs> continuous into discrete so it's it's up to you how you are transforming your data it not necessarily how we um can we say discrete have certain levels uh, what do you mean by level or the data is finite but the data the data is mostly like finite yeah so if you are counting uh, the number of people or number of books or whatever so it, it will be a finite kind of a data but uh, it's not like uh, continuous is like infinite but uh, the way they are expressed you know you cannot like generally cannot say if you're talking about volume you know you will generally get a number that is point something 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 so generally it's not um, um, 
it's not something that you can just count you know it's not like a whole number so that's how we i generally see first time like okay how is it a whole number okay if it's a not a whole number that it may be a continuous variable um and then we have cross sectional and time series again i mean may not work with this that frequently only maybe if you are doing some kind of a, uh some kind of a, discrete could be like months of the year yeah 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 that's that's right yes um and then uh, uh so we have time series data so if you have data that you have collected over a period of time you know like uh data uh, you are looking at uh, you know somebody's performance over a period of time you know how is your website doing every month so every month you are calculating some uh, scores or ratings and uh, over a period of time then you plot it in a graph or you are you know just keeping it in your database so it's data that is related to uh related to time somehow that's that's a time series data and then if you are taking a cross section of the population at a distinct point in time then that is like a cross cross sectional uh, cross section of your data so these are these are data related to uh, which have time in them that probably the previous ones we talk about they have no nothing related to time but this uh, cross sectional and time series data are generally if you are doing some kind of time series you are looking at trends and things like that that's when you will uh, work with this kind of data okay so i think i've covered all the data types yes but we will talk about uh, some of ratio interval and all a bit more detail because when i was making the slides i thought that uh, more information is needed <laughs> on this um so i will cover that again in the next session so um okay so now this is the same data set that we saw before but now some kind of uh, uh some can you dip, uh, between interval and bin yeah so so bin is like when bin is they they're all um um like uh, let me explain with an example so bin is something like you are creating bins like you are uh, giving this ranges for like for age right so i don't know if there is an example here but um I'll, i don't think i have an example but um let's say i have age data like we had on the previous slide here like let's go back there no 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 let it go back to the mm -hmm. previous slide okay so let's say i have this age data here right and i want to uh, analyze instead of analyzing the data for each row for each of this um uh, this data set for each person on this data set i i just want to look at uh, set some date some age ranges mm -hmm. like let's say again taking the example of the website uh let's say i i have people from different a uh, lot of people are visiting 1 million people are visiting my website and i want to create a visualization and i want to see okay how are young people doing on my website and how are middle aged people doing and how are old people doing on my website so what i will then do i don't want to create a graph for each person and have this graph with 1 million data points on it but instead of that i just like my leadership just want to know how this different age groups are doing so i will create then bins with my data you know i will uh, just take one bin let's say 18 to 24 is one set of data then i'll do maybe 25 to 35 that's another bin and then let's say i have like 36 to 30 uh, 40 50 or whatever so i will break down into different bins like this like different ranges like this right so that's when i'm doing um, and that's sometimes we already may have data like that or sometimes we may create it because that's how i want to represent my data so i'm creating bins and we'll also talk about uh, uh, histograms and all where we use bins uh, also and then but interval is like you know so um, and again a lot of this data the uh, data types they're not like exclusive of each other they can be transformed into uh, all of Uh, you know each other or they can be changed in number of ways so now interval is like we'll also see an example so let's say i have i think i have the example of a temperature scale so if on a temperature scale or any kind of scale if you have if you'll see that your data is like um 10 20 30 like that so you're not really summarizing the data you are showing you are showing your data points are like 
10 and then you have 20 and then you have 30 and you have 40 so you have not like summarized your data and formed groups out of them it's just that you have these uh data which are at a same interval of each other i hope i'm making sense uh, but okay so so remember this data set and then now we have kind of transformed that data set into the second data set which is uh, over here uh let it come on the screen okay so it's the same data set as before but here if you see instead of saying uh, the different ages we have kind of changed it to uh, middle-aged elderly middle-aged so so i'm going to ask nan here so if she can find uh, if she can point out which column is what kind of data mm -hmm. and if she can find out what kind of transformation has been done on this as compared to the one that we saw before mm -hmm. And you guys um, can also answer uh, on the comment section if you uh, if you want to. Yeah, I would say in the age column is uh, now it's categorical data, it's ordinal categorical data. Why do you think it's ordinal? Um, for instance, if you tell me the first person is in middle aged group, the second one is then is in elderly aged group, I will naturally know the second person is older than the first person. Okay. Yeah. And for gender, um, it's also categorical data. It's um, binary. It's either one or zero. Okay. And the uh, state is uh, categorical data. Uh, it's showing the where, the, uh, where the person is from. So what kind of categorical data is state? Is it uh, ordinal or is it nominal? It's nominal because we can now, we can, um, I cannot tell was if there, uh, if the person from Minnesota is better than Texas. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's no order in it. And uh, um, for the data in the children column, I think it's uh, numerical data. And the uh, salary is also, um, numerical data mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and what about opinion opinion is category uh, ordinal ordinal categorical data okay so we have some answers coming here mm -hmm. children is discrete salary is uh, categorical so why do you why do you think salary is categorical can't we do arithmetic operations on the salary data we can do right um and the opinion is uh is definitely categorical data and it also has an order to it and uh, okay so i think the dollar sign is confusing people but no <laughs> but this 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 the way I meant it was numerical, <laughs> but if it is confusing you and because of that, you think that it is categorical, that's fine. But uh, I thought <laughs> when I was formulating it, I thought it's numerical. Um, but but yeah, I think um, what is the difference between categorical and numerical data? Yeah, I mean, that's the most important thing to know. <laughs> so if I was not able to explain that properly, I'm sorry about that, but uh, you should totally you know definitely understand what is categorical and what is numerical data right so so the easiest way to know like numerical data are numbers isn't it so any kind of data that you will deal with especially you know like um uh, you know any kind of um financial data quantitative data right which are uh, which are numbers you know they, they could be like heights they could be measurements of different kinds you know lengths and all so anything that is a number and you can then take and you can take that number and you can add it to another number you can definitely add two lengths together you can add two salaries together you know you can so anything that on which you can do some kind of numerical calculations those are your numerical numerical data you know numbers uh, as soon as you see numbers you should start new think numeric but it may not be numeric eventually but at least you should start when you start guessing okay this could be numeric mm -hmm. and then when you learn more about it then maybe you get okay no it's not it is these are numbers but probably these represent something else like maybe these are one two three four five six seven but maybe they are just representing the days of the week so then maybe these are not numerical so you have to 
understand you know but on a, from a first look if you just look at it and you see numbers you should start thinking that it is numeric and then eventually you can then based on as more when you are learning you can decide no 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 this was not numeric and categorical data definitely are data that's not numerical data right like um like i was saying uh, male and female male you cannot add like male and female and calculate some number out of it <laughs> <laughs> right so uh so those kind of data you know which are not numbers mm -hmm. definitely those are categorical data so so think i mean spend some time and think about all the different things that you work with on a day to day basis and try to think is this a categorical data or is this a numerical data and try to make sense out of it because you know sometimes it's not very clear when you just get a data set uh, you know sometimes the way uh, it will be there the way the call like here it is so clearly mentioned age gender state you know sometimes you may get a data set where instead of writing state they would have just written s or st <laughs> you know and uh, instead of putting uh, minnesota texas they would have said 23 25 you know and you may think okay this looks like a number this is probably numerical data but then when you start digging into it you will be like oh my god no you know st means state this is categorical data these are just the names of states you know so um, in real life it won't be that straight forward but and if you assume something in the beginning it may change later on but at least you should know what you are looking at you know and try to understand more and more and then draw your conclusions from that but at least you should understand what is numerical and categorical if you do not understand anything else if i am not able to explain that uh, properly to you uh, you know uh, i'm sorry about that but um, you should definitely understand what's numerical and categorical <laughs> and not any of if you don't understand any of that other things that's fine but try to understand at least this uh okay so we are going to take like a minute a break if anyone so do anyone wants to go have some water or anything and then after like so let's see yeah is 10 to here so maybe a uh, 10 5 we'll start yeah. we'll start back again at 10 5 so we are just here we're not going anywhere if you want to ask anything then we will do that so date and time we generally consider them as a completely different data type you know we call them as a date data type yeah but dip again depending on Uh, the scenario we can consider them as uh, you know numeric or categorical it may change from situations to situation because sometimes you know i have a date i may add i may do a numerical operation on it you know i can add 30 to it and come up with a new date but generally when we are working with it we will just call it like a, in in many i think in like sql or in bigquery they will just call it as a date data mm -hmm. type so it it may it may change from scenario to scenario Let's see how many people do we have. Can we see that here? Fifteen. Okay. How to prepare a data set? I mean, that could take a long time. Like right now, in one of my projects, I am trying to prepare a data set <laughs> since a week. <laughs> so. uh you know if, if somebody gives you a data set that's really great but you know sometimes uh you especially i think in smaller teams like my team is pretty small so i'm the only person doing all all the things so if you may start by creating your data set you know mm -hmm. i like right now i am going through uh data that is stored in database and i'm actually writing codes to change it and transform it you know i have i have a particular problem that i want to solve uh, so i am actually uh, going to database and picking data from that uh, which i think will help me to solve this problem and again it's a trial and error method for me right now because it's kind of a research thing you know I, i'm not uh, i'm not sure that the data that i'm picking right now are going to help me Uh, you know, but I'm going to pick some data based on my understanding of the domain from the database, and I'm going to use that. Um, I mean, it depends, right? It depends. If you have, uh, if you have, uh, like, for some of my projects, the data is there in the database already. The data has been collected from somewhere, and it it is there on the database, and I get the data data from there, and I work with it. But when I get it, it may not be in the form in which I want. I want it. 
so i may change it you know and may or it may even happen that i don't have the data then i will send out surveys i will send out surveys to people and i will first collect the data so that once i have that data then i will probably change it you know the what what you are calling preparing it i will transform it and i will change it and i'll make it to a way that i can work with you know depending on what tool i'm using you know if i'm using r or i'm using python or i'm just using tableau or whatever it is that i'm using i will try to make my data in a way so that i can utilize certain tools or certain packages or whatever it is so so as a data analyst it it is totally part of your work to collect the data mm -hmm. <laughs> you may be like i send out surveys to people right so you may be the person who is sending out surveys so then you again that's where the concept of sample comes in you need to know who are the people who are there in your population because it's them that you are going to send your surveys to and they they are going to respond you know if you want to know about donald trump's comments you cannot send your email to people who have commented about someone else right so it, you need to know and you need to send them and you get the data back and you need to no we haven't even reached pre processing what i'm talking about is first collecting data once you have collected it then when you do transformation and all that's that's part of uh, the pre processing steps how should we start working with time series problem having one input and we will talk about that when we when we get into time series so i think there are people here who are just starting off uh, and i i'm definitely going to talk about time series but we are pretty far away from there we will be first talking about descriptive statistics and all these other steps um, all of these like regression and all and then we will go to go to time series uh gathering data oh are you asking whether gathering data is part of pre processing is that your question okay i think it's 107 i don't know if everybody is back from where they were <laughs> <laughs> um let's let's get started so in the next few slides we'll uh, look at uh, some of the uh, different uh, examples for different data types and nan is going to give it a try and she's going to guess what kind of data she is seeing on the screen and uh, you guys can also guess mm -hmm. and we will try to understand what are these kind of data so what's this we see some starbucks cups here i think what? it's all you know uh, categorical data because um, i would know Uh, tall, tall is bigger than shout. Grande is bigger than tall, and Wendy is bigger than Grande. Right. If you give me the information, yeah. Right, and you have some numbers here, like eight ounces, twelve ounces. Uh, what, what, what is that? I mean, is it's uh, numerical data to describe the the categorical data. I think. Yeah. So this mm -hmm. this data that uh, that they have given here, um, it it can actually. it has a number of uh, you know things like it's a categorical data mm -hmm. even if it's a numerical data you know down here you can totally because they represent these categories isn't yes. it like 8 ounces represents shot mm -hmm. so even though you are seeing it like a number it's actually is representing shot so when you are working with your data mm -hmm. you need to be careful when you are seeing numbers you may initially think this is uh, a numeric data but then as you try to understand it more you may end up using it as a categorical data right yeah and then there is also fixed interval between each of these um, uh, numbers over here isn't yeah. it so but yeah but this this is definitely categorical data and it has a order to it so this is uh, also ordinal data uh and then Okay, let's say I give you this picture. I tell you nothing. I just mm -hmm. give you this picture. What 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 do you understand from this? Like, what kind of data are you seeing on this? Uh, <clears throat> I think it's categorical data to describe um, the category of each bird. So we can define a um, bird according to its feature, their color, their size, and to tell which category it belongs to. Right. So th this is. on a high level this is definitely categorical data you know these are just birds mm -hmm. you know names of birds and types of birds uh we can but we also see something else like we see colors here you know we have birds that are blue we have birds that are like red orange you know so when we work with this data we can 
uh, immediately think about categorizing them into mm -hmm. different colors mm -hmm. and we can also look at different sizes right we can say okay this these are if below this uh, height then this this is a small bird or this is medium sized bird or it's a big i don't know why <laughs> so, <laughs> but as, you know you can you can think about it you know so even if you nobody tells you anything and they just throw this picture at you you can start making sense out of it you can start thinking okay what do i see here i see colors i see sizes i see different kind of features maybe this bird um uh, you know eats this kind of food or this bird uh, has a diff distinct noise that it makes you know you you start thinking about different things you know and uh, thinking how we you will analyze this data or how you will visualize this data so this is definitely uh, categorical data and then um this this is uh uh you know a temperature scale where we have uh, Kelvin, we have Celsius, uh, comparison between Kelvin and Celsius, and we have comparison between Fahrenheit and, uh, and Celsius. So this uh, temperature data, again, temperature is something that we can measure, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a continuous data. Uh, what else uh, can you make sense out? If I just give you this picture, what else can you make sense out of this? Mm, it's interval like and ratio because there is a equal equal um, distance between two numbers um yeah exactly so temperature data you know we it's a, it's something we can measure it's continuous data then mm -hmm. uh, here it's on a scale if we if we see it has like 10 20 30 definitely you know there is um uh specific interval between mm -hmm. them and then you know, temperature data can also be expressed like as a ratio i can say today it was twice as hot at, as it was uh, yesterday right so i can talk in the form of ratio so this is definitely a type of data that can be expressed in terms of ratio um so what's what's uh this uh what do you see here uh it's ordinal categorical data because um i i i would say uh the satisfied is better than unsatisfied and very satisfied is better than very unsatisfied right so this is this is the kind of data that we generally see in surveys uh, if you have ever filled up surveys then you can see that you know they ask us these kind of questions and if you are going to do some data analysis on this kind of uh, data then you should should know that what kind of data it is it is definitely categorical uh, data uh, but then they also have an order uh, to them um okay so now we will go into different types of uh, different types of graphs here so initially my plan was that before i go into graphs i'll talk about descriptive statistics but then that uh, that's that i need to talk about that in pretty detail so i'll do that <laughs> in next session completely so I, we will just uh, get an idea over here about graphs so why why i'm talking about this now because see the way i said that as a as a data analyst you or uh, scientist you have to be very very good with your data you should understand it very well only then you can do any analysis on it now same way it doesn't matter how good your analysis was, what advanced stuff you have done on it, it make, doesn't make any sense if you are not able to communicate it properly to your stakeholders and your leaders and your business partners or whosoever, you know, that has given you that problem. And more often than not, you will be communicating to them through visuals. And they they don't know, and they also don't want to know. They don't want to look at your code. They don't want to see that. All they want to see is a nice and crisp representation of all your analysis, where they can easily understand. And give some example of discrete. Okay, okay, we'll come to that. Let me complete that. Complete this. So, um, uh, so, so yeah. So it becomes very, very uh, important. That's why that you understand what what is good data visualization because if you if you present uh, if you create a visual that does not communicate properly or is so confusing it's not clear then people people will 
totally not get what analysis you have done and most of the time whatever analysis you are doing you you will present it in the form of some kind of a, a graph or some kind of a visual you will have a presentation where you will be presenting to people and you will be showing this different kinds of uh, charts and plots and you will be explaining it to them so it it's another very very crucial part that you have first of all you have the necessary communication skills to be able to communicate and also the necessary visualization skills it doesn't matter what tool you use you can use excel also if you want but whatever it is that you are using you know how to best trans uh, translate your analysis into a graph form so that people can understand it so you need to be very very good in this right so you need to understand your data very well so the middle part you do analysis and then this will be your output so that's that's why it's very important and on this slide the four graphs that i have put here as examples these are probably the graphs that you will work with the most that i work with the most you know and uh, the first one is the bar chart you know it's the bar chart is something that all of us understand even if we are not doing any data and we see it all the time on on tv on newspapers you know it's it's very common it's something that everybody understand it's very simple and it's something that you will constantly uh, constantly work with the, i mean the way i do my work i'll first see whether it can be represented in a bar chart if because of any reason it cannot be only then i will start thinking about other kind of charts you know because everybody understands bar chart and it's so clean and so simple and very little chance you will make some mistake in it so in the bar graph that we have here so generally in the x axis we will have some categorical data like here these are i think names of different dogs and then on the y axis are percentages like what percent of people are what percent of dogs are named this particular name so very simple uh, visualization um, but very frequently used uh, the next one we have here again used extensively is this the scatter plot and this is not a very uh, regular scatter plot but i really like this example so i put here uh, this this is a scatter plot but instead of just having dots uh, for the data points, they have used actually um, colors as well as shape to distinguish. So they, this is weight by height by gender. So you have height on the x-axis, you have weight on the y-axis, and then you are representing uh, females with a pink color, and you are representing uh, males by a blue color, which you know generally are the colors that we use for male and female. And at the same time, if somebody doesn't even understand based on uh, pink and blue, we have already also given the shape, uh, you know, for a female and for a male. So as soon as you see this graph, you not only see the relationship between uh, weight and height, you are also immediately able to see what it, how it looks for the females and how it looks for the males, right? So generally, this this kind of a scatter plot uh, will be used to understand relationships between different variables. You know, if I have two variables, height and weight, and I want to know how they are related, if height increases, does weight also increase or does it decrease? You know, and, and depending on your population, there could be a different relationship, right? So, um, and depending on what variable you are taking, it could be increasing, it could be decreasing, it could be linear, it could be non-linear, it could be any kind of relationship. But scatter plot will help us to figure out in a very easy way. Like we we can see it and we can say, oh, okay. Or we may also decide there is absolutely no relationship between these two variables, right? And the next one is a line chart where we talk about, uh, which is generally used for you know time series kind of um, data. Uh, here generally we we will have the um, uh, the date um, on the x axis and we will have uh, some other um, data on the y axis and we are trying to look at the trends over time like here we have uh, two lines so one is representing total visit this is probably the visit to a website so that's like total visit and then we are talking about unique visit so unique because you know I may visit a website ten times but I'm just one person, I'm not 10 people. So unique visit is one. But if 
uh, but if I'm looking at total visit, I've visited 10 times, right? So, uh, so same way they have tried to uh, uh, create this time series of how things look from 3rd of Jan to probably 16th, 17th of, of Jan. So it's another kind of graph that you will frequently work with. And then the pie chart, which I think all of us are very familiar with, but uh, whenever we are using the pie chart, you should have to be very careful because, uh, again, if you can show this in a bar chart, go for bar chart, don't go for pie chart. But if you feel that pie chart is good, people like it or whatever, so you can go for it, but make sure that you are representing the entire data. If you are using only 50% of 50% uh, of your people in your data set and you are showing it as a pie chart, people may get confused because it has this 360 angle. So immediately it tells you that this is for everybody. But if you have, because of whatever reason, you have not taken all your 100% of your data and you have only taken 50% uh, of data and now you divide it into a pie chart and you are showing it as a percentage from 100, you know, and you are actually messing up your numbers. So don't do that. So if you have all your 100% of data, only then take this. And the other problem is sometimes it becomes a bit difficult to compare the different sections of this pie. Like our eye cannot very easily distinguish, uh, but which it can do very easily on a bar chart. So like I, I was saying, as soon as you have something, see if it can be done in bar chart. <laughs> If it cannot, then think about pie chart or something else. Mm -hmm. But these these four are definitely the uh, type of graphs that frequently any any data analyst will work with. And then we will uh, and then we have some other graphs here, which again you may work with a lot. Uh, the first one is a stacked bar chart. is it's it's a bar chart, but then within the bar itself will be divided into different categories. And then we have a histogram here, which is again, it's also a kind of a bar chart. Uh, but here uh, on the x axis, we have, uh, we generally have continuous data as compared to the previous bar chart that we saw where we have uh, categorical data. And on the y axis here, we have the frequencies. And then we will talk about these more when we talk about uh, dis distributions like normal distribution and all. We will uh, talk about that, but just remember these uh, words, uh, you know, so that you know. Okay, there's something. There's something exists that's called a, a histogram, and then we'll talk about it in detail. And then we have something called this box and whisker plot, which I will again talk about when we have uh, when we talk about uh, descriptive statistics. But this is again another chart that is used to understand mainly the variance in the data, like the range of my data. I want to see how much my data is spread across. And you will make sense more of this when you go to the next uh, session, but this is another plot that is used. And then combo chart, like, you know, you know, you can combine two, three different types of chart and come up with your own chart, you know, like here we have uh, a chart which has both the bar graph as well as uh, the line graph, you know, or uh, you, you can combine different things together and you can come up with your own way of representing data. And then few, uh, the next few slides have some graphs which are not used that frequently, but they may have very much less um, application as compared to the other ones. But these are also something that uh, you can play around with. They're really fun to work with. And the first one is uh, the bullet graph. So the bullet graph is generally used in a scenario when, when you are trying to track your target to your actuals, right? Let's say, uh, in the beginning of 2018, you set some targets for your team, you know, let's say for safety and effectiveness or whatever, all these different categories, you set some targets for you. And throughout the year, you are constantly tracking how close you are to those targets. And then you are probably uh, creating some status reports and you are taking those reports and you are showing it to your leadership. And in, in such a scenario, this is so this is a good graph to use. It's very intuitive. As soon as you see it, you know, OK, so the vertical is my uh, target. And just like a bullet is trying to hit the target the same way, my actuals are those uh, horizontal uh, uh, lines which uh, represent my actuals. And you can immediately see for which categories you have reach the uh, target, for which you are lagging behind. Um, you can also see that not every uh, uh, uh category has the same target some of them have a higher some of them have a lower so you can 
look at uh, this graph and you can make a number of conclusion but generally it will be used for you know an actual uh, versus target kind of a scenario and the next one I, uh, is a word cloud so a word cloud is generally where you you are not showing any numbers you are just showing your words but the size of the words are as per the count of how many times that word has happened let's let's talk about the uh, the Donald Trump question that we were talking about. So if I am looking at, uh, if I want to know, okay, in the last one year, um, uh, let's say in Donald Trump's Twitter, what were the words that he used the most? <laughs> so if, <laughs> if we want to know. We uh, And we extract the data from Twitter and we count for each word, how many times it was used by him. And then we plot it into a word cloud. So here, every word, the size of every word, so crooked word is the biggest in size. So that means he has used this word maximum number of time in his in his tweets. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, I don't know if that's what he has done, but <laughs> this is just an example. And then uh, failing and bad are other words that he has used the most number of times. And even you can play around with colors and you, know, you can have color to represent something else. On, on a word cloud and uh, whosoever made this, they very cleverly kind of drew the outline of Donald Trump so that in, in even though his name is mentioned nowhere, you can immediately look at it. Uh, you know, if, if you're a data analyst and somebody gives you this picture, you can immediately look at it and you're like, oh, okay, this definitely is something to do with Donald Trump. And this definitely looks like, uh, you know, some data from Facebook or, or Twitter, some comments or something like that. So it was very a clever way to kind of communicate um, uh, what the data was trying to say. So you can see and you can say, okay, maybe Donald Trump uses the word crooked a lot on his social media, right? So, and you can do so much with uh, word cloud, but this is just uh, one of the examples. And this is some uh, next one is called a tree map, or we also call it as a mosaic. And I use it uh, a lot for some of my analysis. And uh, OK, so for this one, I'm going to uh, trouble uh, Nan, and I'm going to ask her. Uh, so Nan, uh, here we have a tree map. Mm -hmm. We see this lot of rectangles inside it. There are some numbers. Um, and you know, uh, so, so my question to you is, uh, what do you think the color is representing here? Um, yeah, I think the, the graph is trying to describe the data from different dimensions. Like for instance, the color represents uh, the cells. So the more, uh, no, no, the color represents the profit, sorry. Um, so you see the more profit in, in each box, the, the color will be more green. But if the profit is minus, it will be um, pink or white or right. And, okay. And the size, I think, it represents the sales. Okay. So the bigger the size, uh, the box is, it means um, the more sales in it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So tree map generally we used to show some kind of a hierarchical data on this one, although it is showing us different categories like office machines tables uh, chairs so somebody is trying to uh, see for all these different types of um, products what was the sales and what was the profit so for representing the sales they are using the size of the boxes so the bigger the size the bigger was the sales mm -hmm. for um, for that category and um, for showing the profit they are using the colors so if i have a really deep green that means that i had really good profit on that product and if it is if it going towards red and uh, and more and more into white it means that there was uh, you know like uh, less profit on that uh, so uh, so when you look at this graph you can very easily just by looking at the size and the color you will know so um, which one do you think has has the highest profit here? Uh, the which, most green which, one. Which the product is that? Telephones and the communication, I think. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And which one has the least, uh, uh, you know, is doing really bad, in, <laughs> uh, really bad in terms of 
And I don't think we can see which one is doing really bad in sales because that's very small uh, rectangles don't really have labels on them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but we can definitely see that uh, tables yeah. is, uh, if, you know, it's doing, it has a lot of sales because it has a pretty big uh, box mm-hmm. there, but uh, it is um, red. It's a red box. So even yeah. if it is a big box, a lot of sales, but profit is not doing good. Uh, so that's how you know you can interpret and uh, you know you can play with sizes you can play with colors to uh, to represent uh, your data uh the next one i have here is called uh okay yeah yeah i think we have some responses in the comment section and yes that's that's correct uh so uh, we have here something that is called a sankey diagram you know if you follow some of those uh, uh, some of those posts and stuff about people creating all this complicated tableau <laughs> you probably see this kind of stuff on there you know like you know uh, very complicated uh, very nice looking colorful tableau visuals we mm-hmm. people post those sometimes on linkedin and also uh, so that, you can see this uh, in some of those graphs, but this is also used. I mean, I have uh, used this, uh, although I used it for a different purpose, but here, uh, so when do you use this kind of a graph? You know, I mean, you know, even though I'm saying that, you know, this graph is for this or this graph is for that, you know, it's up to you. You decide how you want to use that graph for which purpose, you know, you can change it, you know, it's not like you have to use this graph for this purpose, you know, whatever you feel, is working well and you are able to communicate to your stakeholders you know you you see who are your stakeholders you know if they are people who have knowledge of statistics data analytics you may go a little more into technical stuff if they are if they have no idea then you can just stick to some bar graph you know it's up to you and your team and who you are working with so you take that decision but at least you should know what are the common type of graphs that you have at your disposal and then you can play around with it as much as possible so here is a sankey diagram generally it is used to show what is the flow how is the flow of data looking like that's why they have these kind of a flow kind of a shape to the lines you know they're not straight lines and uh, in this particular graph they are talking about income so if you look at this you are seeing okay so this is the total income over here in blue and how that income has moved into different different categories and uh, the the size or the breadth of that uh, that le- the line it it tells you the it's kind of proportional to the amount so if you see like tax is pretty big orange line over here but social security is a small green and also the colors here i think they are also representing something or other so uh, and another thing to remember when you are creating a visual nothing should be random on it any because if you if you put random things people will get confused if if you have ordered in a bar graph if you have ordered your bars in a certain way it should mean something they should not be ordered just alphabetically or just randomly if you have ordered something you know there should be some reason why it has been ordered that way or if you have a size going on the size should mean something like you know like here on the tree map you cannot just randomly assign sizes they have to mean something and if you are using colors they should also mean something so every element of your chart should should mean something it should not be just there to make it look nice and beautiful you know yes make it look nice and beautiful but that should not be your main goal your goal that any any element that you are using that is explaining something extra about your data and something that is useful something that you really want to communicate if you don't want to communicate something don't put it on your data you know if uh, you know if and we will talk about like data visualization best practices but don't put things that are not needed only put what is needed and everything that is there on that chart should mean something there should be no meaningless data because if you do that it's just let me tell like tell you from my experience you go to the presentation and people will ask you okay what does this mean what does that mean does the color mean something and if you have just put it to make it look nice you're not making a good impression on anybody so your focus should not be on making things look beautiful and nice 
you know adding unnecessary shadows uh, you know create putting this dashed lines no need for that keep it very simple no need to and if you can do it with bar graph just do it with bar graph no need to go for sankey diagram and all these things <laughs> but but there will be scenarios like i use this diagram when i wanted to show how users are navigating from one part of the website to another part of the website and i thought that there is a flow to it you know whenever you're talking about flows and movement you know it, it kind of really works to use this kind of because it then plays around with the brain of the uh, you know the person who is viewing you know they immediately understand okay there's some some flow in this data you know so anything that you are using should be there very deliberately it should be very deliberate there shouldn't be no you know thing that is just there to look good right so in this diagram they have used this to show the flow of their income how it is flowing they have used color for something they have used the uh, size for something you know and i used it to show the flow of users to from one part of my website from home page to who who is going to this page how many people are going there you know so i use it for that purpose so think about it and think about where you can use this kind of graph and this one is called uh, uh, the next slide it's called a sunburst uh, diagram again it's very similar to a pie chart so be very careful when you are using it and uh, it looks very pretty <laughs> if you put it on your on your uh, deck you know it very it is very attractive uh, it draws the attention of people towards it but again it has the problem of pie chart if you are not representing your entire data don't use it but if you use it then the most innermost circle is the highest level and then as you move outside you know from the center as you go outside each outer circle is representing a further breakdown of data and each of these different sections are representing a percentage account or whatever it is that you want to show but make sure you are using it not to make pretty things but only because this is the only thing that can describe your data the best that's the only reason why you are using it so that's another one and then we have something called heat map again this is something very useful you know um and so on this diagram this is showing um the most photographed places on uh, on earth you know by google or something mm -hmm. so just by looking at it you know you can make sense okay okay so these are the places where people are clicking a lot of pictures and um, and there are other places where there are not many pictures and um, so here they have used the world map and they have used the map and then they have superimposed the data on it uh, but it may be something else you can just have a table mm -hmm. and you can highlight some portions of the table using some colors so uh, you know so this is something that is called a heat map and i think we have this option in tableau to to do heat maps uh so so yeah i think uh, uh, i don't think these are the only type of graphs but mm -hmm. these are the graphs that i have i work with and uh, and these are graphs that i feel that uh, if you know if you know how to create these graphs if you know what are these graphs and you are using them intelligently you can probably do all your all your data visualization using these graphs or using these graphs to create some more i, I think i have a couple of examples on that also but before that we have again some questions here and um, i'm going to ask nan to answer them one by one sure. like uh, so you have a situation here mm -hmm. and you have to guess which graph will you use out of all the graphs that we discussed about mm -hmm. right? and again like i said it's not fixed it's not like okay bar graph is only for this or line graph is only you know it's you you have to think like an artist and you have mm -hmm. to come up okay mm -hmm. uh, but these are simple questions so um uh, so revenue generated by the top 10 products of an organization so you have, i i i am your vp i'm asking you create mm -hmm. this visual for me so mm -hmm. so what will you come up with then i would use um bar chart like it's easy to uh, tell which product has the better revenue than others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think bar chart, bar chart would be. And uh, would you would, will you use any colors on this graph? What will you do about that? Yes, I would use the color to uh, distinguish um, the 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 revenue, like um, the the the. Rev 
um, the best revenue may have the darkest uh, color. Okay. Mm -hmm. and some yeah. people have different opinion. Uh, histogram, bar graph. Uh, so, uh, so uh, this is, uh, I'm, I'm just talking to Rakesh right now. So mm -hmm. Rakesh is my friend, so I can talk to him. <laughs> so, uh, so no, I, I, not, a, not a histogram. We will. We will use a bar graph for it because we have 10, um, like discrete 10 mm -hmm. categories of data. So we will put them in the x-axis and then we will have the revenue on the y-axis. And then uh, we can uh, we can use colors mm -hmm. like uh, Nan said that I think that was a really good answer. We can use uh, color, you know, we can show the highest revenue in green, the lowest revenue in uh, red, uh, you know, or we can even use the colors to just represent different products and we can have like a legend uh you know uh, and tell which color represents uh, what product we can mm -hmm. even do it that way you know but yeah it's up to you you are the data scientist you will take the decision what what you think will work best mm -hmm. uh, and then next one like precipitation rate versus atmospheric pressure what do you think about this mm, for this why i may use um line chart why because, do you think line chart? Uh, because I want to compare the the trend. No, we are not no? talking about. There's no time element here. I just mm -hmm. want to know precipitation rate versus atmospheric pressure. Hmm. If so, I think bar chart. Mm, let's see if we have any combination chart having category on right x. Um. Yeah, I think. The right answer is a scatter plot. Scatter plot. plot. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Because if you remember, I said the scatter plot is used to see the relationship between mm -hmm. two variables, mm -hmm. two data points, right? Mm -hmm. So not data points, two set of uh, maybe some behavior, some traits, whatever, you know. So I want to know precipitation versus atmospheric pressure. I want to know what's the relationship between them. And maybe this the question is not very clear to some people, I guess, but um, I'm trying to understand what is the relationship between them. So then that a scatter plot is the best because it will tell me whether if atmospheric pressure is increasing, then whether precipitation rate is increasing or decreasing. Yeah. That's what I want to know okay. at the end of the day. And the scatter mm -hmm. plot is the best for it. Uh, next one is top trending topics on Twitter in last one week. Mm, and for this, why I may use word cloud. Okay. I think uh, it's kind of natural language, per se, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, uh, what, I think word cloud is a good way. Yeah. Uh, right? So uh, I think it will have a visual impact mm -hmm. on people. You know, uh, you can uh, pick, you can get all the trending topics and you can just get the frequency of that and you can mm -hmm. then plot it in a word cloud and people can directly just see and then they know okay this was the top trending topic and you can you can play around with colors and all if also needed uh number of school shootings in american cities wow <laughs> this why we use um the heat map okay because i want to know how many um um, shooting accident ha happen in each state. Okay. So I think um, the heat map may be better. Yeah. Yeah. So there is, I mean, when we are talking about some sensitive things like school shootings mm -hmm. and we are going to, let's say, present it to somebody, we want them to feel that impact. You know, as a data scientist, you're just not it's not playing with numbers you know you are somebody who is trying to make uh, uh, trying to help people make some really critical decisions mm -hmm. so not just trying to just yeah let me throw some graphs and let me throw some numbers and just i don't really care about it you know you are somebody who want to make a change and you if you're talking about school shootings and you are presenting it to some people who maybe can do something about it you want to have that impact on them so you should uh, a heat map is a really good way to do that. You know, you can have, you can show it on a map, you can show, you can use really bold colors and people can, uh, people can, yeah, I mean, 
uh, even yeah like i said a, a, a word chat or a word cloud is also a good good way so you're thinking you have to think about it you know you have to think okay what am i trying to show i'm trying to show school shootings and this is a really sensitive thing and it's also an important thing and i want people to know what kind of impact it is ha ha having on the lives of people so how best can i show it probably mm -hmm. a bar chat is not but if somebody sees a bar chat they may just think that oh yeah it's just a bar chat like every other bar chat it may not have an impact on them but if we use something like a heat map or something like a word chart you know and we use bold colors then we can definitely you know try to have an impact on anybody that is uh, you know uh, viewing that particular presentation so uh, so mohit is asking can you elaborate on this question uh, which question the number of school shootings in american cities so uh, if you are asking that then we just you know we're just trying to sh uh, decide what's the best way if i have some data on school shootings and i have in uh, uh, you know i have uh, on one column i have cities and on another column i have the number of school shootings that have that have happened uh, let's say in the last one year in those uh, uh, in those uh, cities so that's my data set one column name of city other column number of uh, shootings in that city in maybe one year or 10 years or whatever and then i want you to find the best way for me to represent this data so that you are not only communicating numbers, you are also having some kind of an impact on the people who are viewing it. So yeah, so the word cloud or a heat map is really a good way to do that. And then user behavior, I think I've already talked about it, but still user behavior or the navigation paths on website. Mm -hmm. I think the Sankey diagram can be a good choice because as you said, uh, we can check the um, customer's um, action on website. Right. Yeah, so yeah. when we are talking about paths, mm -hmm. we are talking about flows. Yeah. And a Sankey diagram definitely mm -hmm. will help us with that. And then uh, user retention versus user churn rate on a mobile app. So if if we have, uh, you know, apps and websites, uh, we generally want to know uh, over a period of time, how many users have we retained and how many users are not using our app anymore or our user our website anymore so that's like our churn rate how many people are just inactive or are not not, not visiting our website anymore and how many people we have retained you know over mm -hmm. the last six months or one year so now i uh, you know your uh, director or somebody who is creating a presentation and they have this mobile app and they ask you that hey can you create a presentation for me? And I want to know how we are doing user retention versus uh, user churn rate. So mm -hmm. how do you think we can represent this kind of data? I may use a um, pie chart because pie chart can be a good way to show the percentage okay. for the entire population. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, and we got some other answers like line chart and time series plot. Yeah, I think we can. I mean, depending on, you know, if I want to uh, show my user churn rate every week, Oh, in the last one year how was it every week i can totally use a line chart for mm -hmm. that yeah. you know uh, or i think what rakesh also meant was, was, was the same thing a time series plot so we will have a time element and we will have uh, the uh, the percentages on mm -hmm. the on the y-axis and we can also use a pie chart but again we have to keep in mind that we have taken everybody into account yes. uh, right we can show um, half of it is user attention and then part of it is like genre we can do that but when you are doing that also you have to then communicate that okay this pie chart represents uh, only the users uh, only the last uh, 10 months or you know what is the period of time you also have to communicate that in certain mm -hmm. ways so you have to make sure that you're communicating everything properly uh so this is one graph that i created for one of my uh, one of my projects uh, again this is kind of a combination chat i just wanted to show some uh, examples to you which are graphs which are not like uh, the defined kind of a graph but you know you can play around and you can come up with your own ideas about what you want to do so this is a stack graph that we talk about it's a bar graph but within each bar graph there are categories and I, I have again tried to play with colors. So these are ASU colors. Mm -hmm. And I, I struggle with this a lot. I've been posted on LinkedIn about it. I struggle with these colors so much because, and if you work with a company or everybody wants their brand 
no one wants to go out of their brand and as a representative of your company any presentation you will make you may be very limited with the kind of colors and fonts and things that you are using and that can become pretty challenging if you are working with a lot of data but then you have to stick with only three colors you know so <laughs> so it it, it it's some, sometimes very challenging for me but for this case at least it, it worked out so and i also try to you know play with colors like the black is representing detractors you know and yellow are representing promoters so the good people the people who are promoting my brand or whatever i am using yellow for them and those who are detracting in their not promoting me then i'm using black for them and for the middle people the passives i'm using a maroon color and then again i have used the dots uh, to represent uh, and this one i made on a uh, tableau um, and on um, and i'm using the dots to represent another piece of data which is called a net promoter uh, score which is basically the promoter percentage minus the detractor percentage so instead of having uh again one more uh slide just to represent what is promoter score minus detractor score i'm using everything on this slide but i also don't want to crowd everything so i just used like small dots so that it is easy for someone you know they can just see and they can compare the three groups here and they can immediately say that okay in group three there are a lot of detractors what should we do about it you know and because mm -hmm. i work with marketing so they will probably say that okay in group 3 there are a lot of detractors we need to uh, do something we need to send them 10 different ads and emails and somehow convert them into promoters from being detractors of our brand right so and and you can see that group 2 they are they have very little detractors so that immediately tells you oh my god what are we doing in group two that we are not doing in group three we should start doing that in group three maybe so that our detractors are less uh, the way they are in group two you know so immediately you start making these comparisons and you start uh, drawing all these conclusions and uh, it's a very simple graph there are not too many elements on it but you can be very clever about how you are using it without again it has to be clean there's no uh, unnecessary thing on it you know i don't have any uh, colors that don't mean something every color here means something and also the way this these are ordered right now i kind of changed it a little bit because mm -hmm. i cannot really uh, show our actual project information but the way this all these three graphs are ordered here there is a reason behind that why i have just told group 1 group 2 group, group 3 but why this one is first and why this one is second and why this one is third there was a reason for that also mm -hmm. so nothing here is there just because of random reason the way it is ordered the way the colors are used everything has a reason behind it and um and then this was another way that we can do a bar chart uh and again this is from one of my projects so and i think this is also uh, done with tableau so um again it's a it's a very simple chart it's just a bar chart but then again we have used gradient we have used the colors in a gradient and immediately as soon as somebody sees this it's a very simple graph so they're not getting confused but they can make a lot of sense from this they can see that okay the first category is culture mm -hmm. so maybe in culture this particular team or this particular company or whatever they're doing really good they're at the top in terms of culture they are scoring 47 so they are very good um, and because it is a darker color this is also a very something that is very important to this team uh, but there is something called growth which is also important because it is still a pretty dark maroon but it is down there somewhere so that means if we are scoring pretty low on growth you know so when you represent this to someone they will very easily make sense what this means and they can immediately uh, start to uh, you know take some conclusions and work towards uh, improving it so these are some examples from my uh, personal uh, projects uh, yeah so i think we have covered everything that we had planned for this class uh, so for the next class uh, we will start by answering questions so we are going to look at the comment section and anything that we uh, could not could you tell a reason for each I uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Karthik, you have to elaborate a bit. I don't know which one, what you are referring to. Um, but um, but yeah. So we will go through your comments. We'll see if there are any questions that we did not answer, 
or uh, or even if we answered maybe we can answer it in a better way mm -hmm. uh, so we'll go through that and we will the first thing we'll do in next uh, next session is answer questions that we couldn't answer uh, and then I plan to uh, talk about ratio and interval data types uh, with some more examples and talk about some more properties. Uh, okay, uh, we'll go back to that Kathy once I'm done with this. So um, with some properties and some more examples, and I think some people asked for more example on discrete data or something like that. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so we will talk about all of that. So we'll talk about uh, either I'll answer back to you uh, separately or we will, maybe we should just talk about it so that everybody uh, also understands it mm -hmm. so we'll talk about that so we'll uh, so we'll do that the first thing we'll do is answering questions that we couldn't answer right now and um, we'll talk about ratio and interval data types and i think there was something else also i want to talk about some other graph or whatever so we will cover some more uh, examples in a bit more detail and then um, uh, you know we will jump into uh, descriptive statistics and we'll talk about mean median mode range variance and uh, standard deviation so that should um, that should give us enough background for us to start with uh, normal uh, distribution. So I plan to go through normal, exponential, binomial, all the different distributions. But before we can even go there, we need to have some background. So that's what I'm trying to do right now. So, uh, but I, but I'm hoping that um, you know, descriptive statistics may take a long time. I don't know. I, I am yet to create all the slides <laughs> for that. <laughs> but, um, but um, I'm hoping that. Um, I can cover that and at least uh, do introduction to a normal distribution because I think that you know each distribution will take me a long time. So, but but yeah, that's what this is what I am planning. But I also want to wanted to ask like uh, I cannot do a three four classes. Karthik, I work full time. <laughs> I work um, Monday to Friday full time, so I cannot do the max I can do is two classes. But then I wanted to ask like what what's a one class definitely during weekend but the other one during weekdays and uh, i know a lot of you are in india so my evening time i don't know you guys may be going to office or to your uh, colleges and classes so i'm not sure what time during the weekday will work for you uh, but uh, from my end you know i will i'm thinking some somewhere around mid of the week like on wednesdays or thursdays and uh, you know evening for me you know like 7 30 p.m or 8 p.m which will be morning for you like morning 8 8 a.m or something like that so i don't know if that is something that will work for you guys but uh, i work um uh, every day so i can't really do <laughs> three to four classes although i would love to do that but i can't um and uh, so yeah so please let me know um uh, what do you think about uh, what day during the week will work best uh, from my end, uh, weekday evenings are fine for me because I'm back from work. You know, I'm home max by 6.30, I'm home. So, you know, an hour or so after that, I can I can do uh, one more session. But we definitely mm -hmm. should have a couple of sessions every week. Uh, but if there are holidays or something, you know, and I can do more session, I, I will I will try for that. So going back to this graph. So was, was your question about this graph? Can you tell a reason for each? What does that mean? Okay. I'm not sure, uh, Karthik, what your exact question was. Just send me your question on LinkedIn and I will respond back to that there. Okay. So, so yeah, so I think this was uh, our uh, whole presentation for today. I hope uh, you got to understand uh, something from today's session uh, but uh, you know don't just if you're really interested in learning about data science don't just depend on these uh, sessions you have to go back and you have to spend time on your own also and understand it and um, uh, you know so i don't know if all of you have any books or you have access to any resources but just uh, before we go to next class try to revise everything that we have gone through uh, try to think about them try to relate them to real life examples and uh, you know uh, and then if you have any questions just reach out to me on linkedin in the meantime and uh, you know i'll try my best to answer all questions uh, nan is also here so she will be helping me um, um and we'll see how best we can answer questions <laughs> um so so yeah so this was uh, all for today and uh, we will discuss uh, what day we will uh, plan for the next session
So thank you, everyone. And uh, those of you who are in US time zone, I hope you have a rest. <laughs> good uh, you know sunday for the rest of the day and those of you are in india i hope you have a good start to your next week mm -hmm. i hate mondays but i <laughs> hope you have a good start to monday and then we will talk again soon and um, uh, just subscribe to this channel and then i can uh, i don't know if this time i scheduled a session i don't know if you can just subscribe you will get notification isn't it when i yeah i guess but, so yeah but yeah but mm -hmm. i'm i'm still trying to figure out that uh, the technical part of YouTube, <laughs> I'm struggling with it, but I'll try to do something. But about it, but uh, but yeah. So um, let me know. Let yeah. Let give me some feedback on how do you think? Was I talking too fast? Was I not making sense? Give me some feedback, you know, so that I can think about it before the next session. And uh, I know people are from different background, but uh, just let me know. Okay. So thank you, everyone, and I will talk to you guys again in the next uh, next session yeah thank you